I'm gonna need some helpers up here this morning. Who's gonna help me? Miss Riley, Rosemary, Bells. Do you wanna come up here? Come on, girls, come up here. All right, but if you're up here, you gotta sing. All right, the words are gonna be up there on the screen if you don't know them, okay? Now you guys know most of them. Why don't you go down there so they can see you? Rosemary, just go down there so they can see you. Girls, go up front so they can see you. There you go. All right, ready? This is the day. Why don't you guys all stand up? Stand up. Ready? This is the day. This is the day. Wow. 
sure to get you next week. All right. Let's say happy birthday to these. Happy birthday to you. Brother Matt Bird, can you please dismiss us to Sunday school? Father God, I am grateful today and thank you for sunshine. Thank you for your opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for those that have come out today and those that come the next hour. Lord, I pray for preaching and teaching this morning to each of us individually and just to meet those and be able to push aside the cares of the week and the week to come and just to get rest in the Lord's habits here today. Thank you for those beautiful times. Amen. You can be dismissed to Sunday school.
Thank you for being here today. What a beautiful day in Seward. You know it's like this 365 days a year. Just some days we got to go 10 miles up to see the sun, right? But what a beautiful day. And it has that feel of fall. Fall is in the air. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We've been taking a look at principles in God's word that if we walk through this life trying to figure things out from an earthly perspective by what we see or think or perceive, oftentimes we miss out or we see things just the opposite of what God's trying to do. So we've been looking at a few things, and today we're going to look at another principle that we'll find here in 1 Peter chapter 5. But let me ask you a couple of questions. In the, in the secular world, um, there are distinct levels of authority. So, for instance, in the military, you could categorize people as, what's one group that you could categorize soldiers or people in the military? Officers and enlisted. Yeah, enlisted. And, and within that, that structure is a chain, a chain of command from the top on down. So in the sports world, how would we categorize? We have coaches and we have Players, yeah, and then there's people in between that help support those, those players and those coaches and assisting them. In the business world, you have the corporate heads, and then as you work through that corporate chain of uh, command, there are managers and personnel, and then there are laborers and labor unions and stuff. And, but it's interesting, usually in the, in the world that we live and operate in, the one at the top usually is the greatest. It's the politician that has the most power. You know, it's the corporate head who is the CEO. But how does God look at you and I as we fit into this world? If you go to 1 Peter chapter 5, let's look at just a couple of verses here. 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll go down to verse 5. It says this, likewise ye younger, and everyone said amen, right? You're all like, younger, get a grip here on this one. Submit yourselves unto the and to the elder, yeah, and if we just stopped there, everyone would go, amen, life's done, let's leave. But the next verse tells us, yea, all of you, those of you that aren't younger, that are before younger, after younger, way after younger, whoever you may be, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with, what's the next word? Humility, humility. yeah, humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the, what's the next word? To the humble, yeah. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You see, God will lift up if you and I will humble ourselves. And so the principle we're going to look at today is the way up for you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, as we live in this world, is down. It's the opposite of what we think. It's the opposite of what we pursue. It's the opposite of what we see around us. The way up is, it's down. Um, humility. What is humility? Let me just stop here for a minute. You help me out. How would you, how would you describe or define humility? Good morning, Gary. Good morning. <laughs> help me out here. How would you define humility? Yeah, there is an aspect of humility that when we look at others, we, we see them differently. We see them actually the way of G Jesus does. More, Do we see them as more important than ourselves? How else would you describe humility? Go ahead, Sally. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's interesting? When we look at this aspect of humility, there are times that we think we got it, and that's really just pride, even in the sense of we think we're, hum you know, humble. Yeah. What else do you think of? Go ahead, Scott. A grace perspective. A grace perspective. Yeah. Yeah, humility, how we see ourselves. 
humility, there's an aspect by application that if you don't get recognition, does it bother you? At rest, when you aren't given attention, where you're not recognized, and the flip side, you're at rest when you're not liked and despised. That's an interesting part of, of humility. And uh, as we look at the scriptures today, go over to James for a minute, James chapter 4. I want you to see how God repeats this same instruction dealing with humility. In James chapter 4, verse 10, you know this verse. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will what? Lift you up. You see, what's interesting is that real greatness only comes from God, and he can lift you up however he wants, whenever he wants. And he has the power to exalt, and he has the power to take down. You find that all throughout the Old Testament. It, if we were to just kind of quickly skip a rock, and I'm just going to look at a few verses, then we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Look at Joshua chapter 3, verse 7. After Moses died, Joshua becomes the new leader, of Israel, and God tells Joshua that he would lift Joshua up in the eyes of the people. Look at Joshua 3, 7. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. You see how that Joshua would be lifted up by the Lord? We find this in the... In, uh, Interestingly, if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15, and look at verse 17, when God used the prophet Samuel to confront King Saul about his pride, Samuel reminds him that it was when Saul was humble that God had blessed him, 1 Samuel 15, 17. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord appointed thee king over Israel. We find this in the, in the life of, of David. Go over to 1 Chronicles 17. I know you're probably feeling like this is a sword drill this morning here. 1 Chronicles 17 and down in verse 7, we find in the life of David. You see the prophet Nathan delivered God's blessing to David. He told him that God had found him humble and would lift him up. 1 Chronicles 17, verse 7. Now therefore, thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, even from following the sheep, that thou shouldest be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with thee whithersoever thou hast walked, and I have cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and have made thee a name like the name of the great that are in the earth. You see, in all through the Old Testament, to make a great impact, you need the favor of God. God's favor. It's God who lifts up, and it's God who takes down. And the question is, how does his favor come upon you and I? And we find throughout the, the scriptures this principle of it's through humility. It's the opposite of what the world will squeeze into you. It's the opposite of what we're taught from the time we're little. So then the question becomes, how do we become humble before God? How does that happen? How is it that, is there anything I can do to find God's favor and find humility? Well, we, we're going to see a few things in the scriptures today in how you and I can look, where we can look. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, thank you for your holy word, how you have preserved this for our benefit. And Lord, I need your help. We need your help. As followers of Jesus, as followers of your son, we need your help in this world. We'll never be what you desire for us to be until we're willing to turn and to turn to you and look to you and ask for your help. And you desire to help us from the inside out that begins at the day that we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And through your grace and even your mercy, Lord, you are willing and desire to work in us and through us for us to yoke up with you and to walk through this world not trying to carry the burdens of life, but to walk with you. So, Father, I pray that you just loose your word now, that you'd bind the enemy, you'd help us to not only see this principle, but by your grace to live it out in those areas of our life we need to surrender. So, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for those that are here now and those that are online. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
So I want to look at a few directions that you and I can look to have humility. And they're very simple. The first one is we're just going to look up, look up. I think one of the keys to humbling ourselves is where we look. And the question is, do I look up? So we'll go to this first slide. Yeah. We're having a little problem with ex with uh, power. What's that? Oh, no, I did not. Thank you. Yeah, Stacy mentioned, did you tell them what they're looking for in the picture? So in this picture today, which may be the slide that you see all morning, is this little chick among all the ducks. Okay. And Stacy, if that doesn't work, just restart the computer and reopen it. It's right on the desktop. All right. So the first look that I want us to consider, if you head over to Philippians chapter 2, go over to Philippians chapter 2, and that is, will we look to Christ? Will we look to Christ? Now, it's amazing that, that God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, is the perfect example of humility. So if you go over to Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5. Jesus, If you think about it, Jesus left his home in heaven, a place of splendor, came to this earth, clothed himself in humanity, put on flesh, so that he could experience everything that you and I will ever go through, and allowed his very creation to hang him on a cross for the benefit that relationships could be restored with the living God through Jesus Christ, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he did this not demanding his own rights of who he is and, and who he was at that time, but living a life of service. Look at Philippians 2 and go down to verse 5. Here's what Paul wrote as he wrote these believers in Philippi. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him, here's our principle, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things under heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." You see, just before Jesus died on the cross, he even demonstrated humility again. What did he do? He washed his disciples' feet. You guys think you're, you're great, you want to be great? And he said, here's an example. And he stoops down of all the things he could grab. He grabs a towel and a basin, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. If you go over to the uh, Gospel of John, let's kind of skim through this for a few minutes. I want you to see from the scriptures what Jesus did. Then we're going to look at what he said. John 13, and go to verse 15. Amazing. John 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Jesus gave up everything. Amazing. Everything. You can often tell if someone is humble by what they say about themselves. You ever have a conversation with somebody? And within seconds, it's turned from, I can't even remember my, like, what I was talking about. But they're talking about themselves, which is okay. I mean, I, I like to listen to people. And, you know, sometimes people... I think about this in the context of starting out with new students. Sometimes they're kind of quiet, but you ask them about their hometown or why they're here in suit, and pretty soon they just kind of wake up and begin to talk about their family and stuff. But look at John chapter 5. Head over to John chapter 5 and verse 19. John chapter 5 and verse 19. I want you to see what Jesus often spoke about. Verse 19, John 5. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son, speaking of himself, 
can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Go down to verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Flip over to John chapter 6 and verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Look at John chapter 8, verse 28. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Look down to verse 50. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Head over to John chapter 14, verse 10. John 14, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. And then down in verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. You see, Jesus wasn't about being absorbed about himself. <clears throat> he wasn't about seeking his own glory. It's interesting as we walk through this life, the natural thing is to draw attention to self, to glorify ourself, to lift up ourself, to get credit for the smallest things, and we get bent out of shape when something goes unnoticed, and hey, I had a part in that. How come nobody said anything? But if you look to Jesus, it was always about, I, and it's amazing to me as I look at the scriptures, about the Father, glorifying the Father, speaking what the Father had to say, being obedient to carry out the very will of the Father again and again and again. Even John the Baptist, you, you think about in the Gospel of John, if you go over to John chapter 1, verse 27, John the Baptist focused on the greatness of Christ. He had no need to promote himself. Look at John 1, 27. He it is, speaking of Jesus, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. Look at John chapter 3, verse 30. Speaking of Jesus, he must increase, increase, but I must decrease. When we look to what Jesus did and the way he humbled himself and listen to what he said, he always promoted the Father's glory. Where will we look as we go through this life? And I submit to you this principle, the way up is down. If I don't look to Jesus, I'll just forget about why I even exist and why I'm here on the planet. Why God may allow things, things that will squeeze my faith at times that he wants to do through me, to prepare me, to draw me closer to him so that he can work in the life of someone else. I'll become absorbed with my little world, the things that I'm overwhelmed with, the things that I have to get done, and I'll forget about what Jesus wants to do. So we need to look up. Hey, look at that. There's a slide. And then secondly... We need to look in. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17. Head back to Jeremiah. About the middle of your Bible here. Isaiah and then the book of Jeremiah chapter 17. I want you to see what the Bible, how the Bible characterizes your heart and my heart. If we are going to look in and consider our motives, we need to recognize the true condition of our heart. Jeremiah captured that. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful, and it doesn't just stop there. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You want to know the condition of my heart? Let me just be transparent and expose it to you. The scripture tells me it's deceitful above all things. When you look at me, like I'm, most of the time, if I'm honest, I don't know if I've heard, I'm a skeptic. 
which means when you say something, now for you all that I've known you for a long time, but when someone says something to me, before I'm all in, I got to see some action. I got to see some demonstration that what's behind your words, really, the intent is there. I, naturally, I'm a skeptic. My wife, just ask my wife, well, I'm not feeling well. I got kind of an upset stomach. I can remember years ago, she says, well, I've got this natural oil. And I'm like, my first response is, yeah, right. No, really, just put a couple of drops in there, take a drink. An hour later, I'm like, okay, I'm in. The skepticism was gone. I don't know how this stuff works, but it worked. Yes. Yeah, the <laughs> there's... That's the skeptic, yeah, right there, right? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The reality is that we are born self-centered. I mean, you think, I think I got to go squeeze little Mason last night. You know, look at that little face. And, uh, but you know what? We are self-centered. That little guy is already learning stuff. When he doesn't want things to go a certain way, I, I've learned this. He's, he's now doing this. Put the head back. Who taught him that? Well, Samuel did, right? We'll blame Samuel. He wants his needs met. When I'm hungry, I'm letting you know. When my diaper is soiled, I am letting you know. When I'm tired, I'm letting you know. You know, as adults, we just get a little better about hiding the self-centeredness of our hearts. But unless we choose to humble ourselves, it's always there. And the self will always become the motivator for what we do and even how we serve. Look over in Luke chapter 14. Jesus tells this interesting parable. Luke chapter 14 and verse 7. And this is a classic how this parable reveals the selfish desires of our hearts. Luke 14, verse 7, and he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. Now, Jesus is in the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread, and it's the Sabbath day. So he puts forth this parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms. So who's the greatest here? Saying unto them, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, that room of honor, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee, bade thee, and him come, and say to thee, give this man place, that thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. Again, I'm sorry, this, this seat that you're in right now is, uh, is reserved for someone else. Can you head back to that other room? You know, and off you go with your head down. Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. Verse 10. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou, thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Look at verse 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. The way up is down. You see, the self-centered heart always wants recognition and applause. God doesn't always care about... Now, now catch this. I'm just going to throw this hook out there. How we serve, but really the motives behind why we serve. God always looks at the heart. What is it that motivates you to do what you do in your workplace, in your neighborhood, maybe within the local New Testament church? Is it to get attention? Is it to lift yourself up? Or do we draw attention to Jesus? Look over 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want you to see what Paul wrote to these believers. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all, then were all dead. 
and that he, speaking of Jesus, died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Am I living for myself? That's the natural way of, of my flesh. Or am I living to love Christ, or do I just love myself? So I need to look at my motives as I look in, but look at Luke chapter 18. This other aspect of this is I need to really look at and examine my thoughts. Look at Luke 18. Proud people think highly of themselves. Humble people think highly of God. Jesus tells another parable about pride and humility. And he points to how ridiculous thinking highly of ourselves within the context of approaching God. Look at this parable. Luke 18 and then down in verse 10. Verse 9, it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican, a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men. Then he describes these other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much an eye unto heaven, his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It's interesting how highly we oftentimes, if we're honest, will think of ourselves and poorly about others. In this manifestation of pride, we find over and over and over again. It's a good thing that God is grace, shows us grace. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. Paul wrote, these believers in Rome, Romans 12, 3, for I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You see, only God knows our true nature and our motives and our thoughts. But will we be like the psalmist in Psalm 139, head over to Psalm 139 and look at verses 23 and 24. Here's what the psalmist said. 139 verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Do I ask God, do I look in as I look up and ask God, would you search my heart and expose my real motives of my heart and my mind? Am I more focused on me or him? So humbling ourselves, it starts with looking up, looking in. But here's another aspect of this. Go back to Philippians for a minute here, Philippians chapter 2, and that is looking out. One of the best tests of humility is our willingness to serve others. All I have to do is look at my life. Am I willing to serve others? And I'll be honest, if you're the normal person, you're overwhelmed just with living your life within the context of your family, within the context of coming to church, with the context of friends. And you're pulled this way and that way at work. I've got this and I'm overwhelmed. There's no way I'm going to get this all done. And in my family, I have responsibilities. And I, those things need, and I, you just feel like you're tugged to and fro. And serve others? Well, pff, yeah, if I can fit it in. And we make promises, we say things, and sometimes we just don't fulfill. But one of the best tests of humility is our willingness to serve others. In Philippians chapter 2, where we were earlier before it describes Christ's great humility as he came to this earth and gave himself for you and I, Paul admonishes these 
these believers in Philippi to humble themselves by looking outward. Catch this in the scriptures, Philippians 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And here's, here's the principle in verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look out. Look at those around you. You see the word that's used there in, in verse 3, to esteem other better than themselves? That is to regard or to value someone else as more important than you. Listen, our natural self is to preserve life, take care of me, watch out for me, support me, even within the context of our family sometimes. But to esteem others, do I value others more important than myself? Well, God has made everyone in his image. In fact, if you go back to Genesis, do I have it up there? I do. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis 1, 27. How important is the one or those that God will allow to cross your path to God? Genesis 1, verse 27, so God created man, that's your next door neighbor, the person you work with, the God allows to cross your path. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Jesus, when he looks at others, he sees the reflection of who he is, even in the fallen state of of those that may turn their back or reject him. In Hebrews chapter 2, head over to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Go back to the last part of, near the end of your Bible, Bible, Hebrews, James chapter 2. Go down to verse 9. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who, may, who was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You see, God has made every human being in his image, and Jesus died for every person. Why is it, if you, you want to know a good measure of humility in your life, it's how we respond to others when God brings them across our path. Well, I'd help you out, but I just can't. There's no way I can. Well, then why is it that God has allowed them to cross your path? There's got to be a reason. It's just not chance. You didn't just show up at the store and, and cross paths with somebody. Maybe you were reaching down on the bottom shelf, and they were reaching on the top shelf, and next thing you know, you're getting hit by stuff on the top shelf. God allowed that for a reason. And the question is, is do I see people the way Jesus sees people the way Jesus saw you I made you I created you in my image my son died for you and for them when we see others as Jesus sees them it helps you and I to be reminded of not only his humility and what he desires to do in us and through us but that he's he's got a purpose so I do I look out to esteem others do I look out to serve others Go back over to uh, Galatians chapter 5 for a minute. It's important that we have the right attitude, but God calls you and I to do things, to act. Look at Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. We do have freedom in Christ, by the way. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, that's me, but by love, serve one another. Serve one another. Philippians 2, 4 tells us to look on the things of others. We're good at giving close attention or looking to ourselves. 
giving myself special consideration. But God says, how will you, as you walk through this life, relate to others? Will you serve others? One of the best ways that you and I can ever have the greatest impact in a non-believer is how you serve them. Within your workplace, wherever you live, play, whatever you do. When you have an opportunity to do something that most people would say, I just don't have the time, why would I do that? I don't even know you. For you to choose to serve someone else, it speaks volumes to them. And it opens the door for you and I to be able to share our faith of our relationship of who Jesus Christ is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The people that had the greatest impact in my life were those who should have never invested in my life. Why would they? They don't get anything in return. Nothing. And yet we chose to invest time and everything for the sole purpose that the door might be open, that they could share the gospel with me. And you might say, well, that's kind of self selfish on their part. Really? I know where I'm going to spend eternity. It's so funny how our mind thinks sometimes. I'm going to lose out if I, if I don't have the freedom to go there or do that. There is more joy and freedom when you and I have the, the opportunity to share the hope we have in Jesus Christ. On my worst day, when I finally come to myself and I lay down in bed and I'm like, <sighs> and then I just begin to think that, good night, I know a living God and he knows me. I know where I'm going to spend my eternity. And as bad as I think my day went, there are people on this planet that live horrific lives that if they just looked at your worst day would think, I wish I had that kind of life, that kind of royalty. And it's amazing. Will I serve others? Am I willing to serve my brothers and sisters in Christ within the body of Christ? When we look away from ourselves and toward others, it helps us choose humility. Will I esteem and serve others? I need to look up. I need to look in. I need to look out. And this last thought I just want us to look at, and we're going to wrap this up. Go over to the book of Daniel chapter 5. Seeing the results of pride in our world ought to be a motivator to embrace humility. Pride hurts people in so many ways, and yet we find in this world over and over pride again and again. Pride keeps people from coming to know a living Savior. Why don't people who have heard the gospel and even seen God at work in their lives receive Jesus Christ as Savior? You know what the underlying issue is? Really, it's pride. Listen, I, why do I need that? I'm pretty good. I haven't murdered anyone. Oh, no, I don't really go to church. Oh, I read the Bible every now and then. People, you know, one of the scariest things is religion. Religion. How it dupes and blinds our true relationship with a living God. Religious people don't see their need for a Savior or to repent because they just think they're good. They're good. Life's good. Look at Daniel chapter 5 and go down to verse 22. And I want you to see the example of, of Belshazzar in the book of Daniel. He had seen his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, humbled by God and repent. But I want you to see his life. Daniel 5 verse 22. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knowest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the God of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand, catch this, thy breath is, and whose all, who are all thy ways, hast not, Thou not, hast thou not glorified. You see, it takes humility to acknowledge that you and I are a sinner. Spiritually bankrupt. 
no hope until we saw Jesus as Savior. Isn't it interesting how sometimes we walk through this world? And imagine walking through this world with a name tag. Hi, I'm Ken, sinner. <laughs> and we all have these tags. You know, hi, I'm Arthur, sinner. And that's the name tag that we have as we walk through. The day that we saw Jesus and recognized who he was, hi, I'm Jesus, Savior, holy, righteous. And what's amazing is Jesus would be willing to exchange my name tag, Ken Sinner, for his. And now when Jesus sees you as a child of God, someone who's believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he sees righteousness, not because of anything of who we are, what we say, what we've done, but because of Jesus. Jesus was willing to come and live the life we should have lived and die the death that we're all condemned to die apart from Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I'll give you my righteousness. I'll die in your place. <clears throat> An amazing thing that what Jesus would do, it takes humility to acknowledge that I am lost and a sinner. But that's where salvation by faith has to begin. That's the beginning. My world view was, I'm okay, haven't done anything really bad compared to as I look to others. And when this young preacher began to share Jesus with me, it wasn't long where I recognized it doesn't matter on my best, my gooder, goodest day, Gary, it's not good enough. My righteousness is as filthy rags. And then I came to the realization as a senior in high school, not only am I lost, I am spiritually bankrupt with no help until I saw the one that said, it is finished, I've done it all, I offer you salvation, all you have to do by faith is receive it and believe on me. Jesus took and went through what I am condemned as a lost person to have to go through. Jesus said, I'll die in your place. Praise the Lord, he would do that for me. You know, we think, we gloss over, Hollywood glosses over the cruelty, the horrific nature of Jesus as he was unrecognizable as he hung on that cross and went through the, the most horrific Thing that man could ever do to a human being. Why would he do that? Because he said, I'll die in your place, Ken. I'll die in your place. I'll die in the place of everyone on this planet to make a way so that a relationship could be restored. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, I love that, shall be saved. Shall be saved. Well, pride keeps people from getting saved. Pride keeps people from doing right. Why do people struggle with the same temptations over and over? Well, yes, our flesh is weak. Why, why in relationships do sometimes we refuse to get help? Well, you know, because if I do, then I'm going to have to expose my weakness or whatever. Why do brothers and sisters in Christ allow offenses and hindrances in their relationship go undealt with over time? And divide them, it's usually pride. Why do individuals remain backslidden so far from God for months or even years? In many cases, the answer is just, I know what I should do, but it's pride. And the results of pride are disastrous. All right, buckle up. I'm going to skim here really quick. Proverbs 16, Proverbs 16, verse 18. Look at the results of pride. Pride Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs eleven two, 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. God tells us again and again, if we humble ourselves, 
He'll give us the grace to take the steps forward we need to, to not only restore relationship with him or to conquer struggles, but to help us to have the right perspective. Look at James chapter 4. Maybe this will be our last verse. Hebrews, James chapter 4, verse 6. James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You see, pride will keep people from getting saved. It'll keep people from doing right. It causes people from getting along. The Bible tells, what's, what is the root of contention? If you've got some contention with someone else, it doesn't matter if it's within the body of Christ or outside the body of Christ. What is the root, if you were to boil it all down? It all comes back to that P word, pride. You find it, did I put the, yeah, if you, you can look these up later, Proverbs 13, 10. The Bible says this, only by pride cometh contention. It's always the root. Proverbs 21, verse 24 tells us, Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. It's always the issue of pride. It's one of the biggest challenges in relationships. I don't like admitting that I'm wrong, even when I know my wife is right. There's something in me. And we try to oftentimes, as we go through life, our focus is on us and proving how everyone else is wrong instead of seeking to restore the relationship. You can win an argument sometimes, but it's just not healthy for the relationship. We think that the way up is just, it's all about me. It's about promoting me. The question is, is where will I look? Will I, will I realize that really the way up is down, that I need to look? I need to look out. I need to look up. Jesus, yep, and to consider what he's done and how he's saved you and I and how he's given us hope. Will I look in and ask God, will you search my heart? You know, we might consider that question, but what if God says, well, what about this area of your life? God, I don't know if I want to really deal with that? Will I look in? Will I look out? Will I see people the way that Jesus sees people? In his image, the one that he died for, and will I look around and let the destruction that comes through pride in our world serve as a warning? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The way up is down. It's crazy. It makes no sense, but it's his way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this challenge in your word. Lord, you know you know us better than we know ourselves, and you know we're people of flesh, children, your children, born again because of Jesus and the finished work through his death, burial, and resurrection, and yet we still walk through this life as Paul did and those before us, those that will come after us, this flesh against the spirit, Lord, help us to yield to your spirit today. And as you speak to us through your word, may we be quick to humble ourselves, confess those areas of our life that are hindering our walk with you and our relationship with you. Lord, and just look to you. You want to do great things through us in the lives of other people. It takes humility. Father, thank you for being a good father and a long-suffering father. Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us, even those times of our life where we've wandered and strayed. Father, I thank you for your son Jesus and his willingness to leave his rightful place, to endure the cross and shame and the horror of, of all that man could do because of a love for us that is hard to understand, that a relationship might be restored. Thank you, Jesus, for your persistence in seeking us and confronting us that we might know you as Savior and Lord. 
Father, thank you for this day. May you work in our hearts as we continue to worship you in this next hour as our preacher comes. Just give him liberty and freedom to proclaim the truth that you have specifically for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. On the screen you'll see among all these little duckling is this chick in the lower left corner right there. Thank you for being here. We are dismissed.